So let's get started with this presentation given by Marta Fuste, Global Strategy from Didi Foods. And let me tell you that she's an expert marketer in digital transformation technologies. She has developed her career internationally in entrepreneurial strategy operations and marketing with over 10 years working in quickly growth companies, both in the technological sector and DD and BRCK, as well as in big consumption such as Reckitt Beckinser and Advisem. So let's welcome Marta Fuste. Thank you so much, Vicky. Hello, good afternoon, my name is Marta. And today I will tell you about consumer's experience. Let's start with an image. Well, an image or a selfie. And we may think that this is something from 2021. But it, t- it turns out that the first one was taken in 1920 by two scientists. With this, what I mean is that we have more human needs and technology is changing throughout time, but our needs and we do not change. And that's why it's so important to understand consumers. This also affects the way in which we work. We focus so much in our famous metrics and fix parade, how our revenues are and how to improve them. But that is not the, the consumer's language. Consumers are thinking, why do I need this app? Or why do I need this product? Or which is the best product for me? So when we're thinking about consumers, first of all, we change the way in which we work. And that's why today I'm going to be focusing a lot on consumers and the consumer's psychologist that defines the decision-making process. Consumers also have a trigger, something that influences their decision-making. And this triggers may be Facebook or a friend sharing the information on this product with them or probably doing a Google search. So there are several drivers in decision-making. But first of all, what's important is understanding consumer and understanding why these decisions what defines of a consumer wanting or needing a certain product. And it's really useful thinking about this psychological maps for decision-making. Thinking, I have this product, so what's the first step a consumer should take in order to buy my product and what's the flow or sequence in the decision-making process? So today, I will propose a framework to have a better understanding of this framework. And this frame, framework is... is uh, called the Reforge, and it's based in four important points. First of all, the emotion. Every decision starts with an emotion. Secondly, logic. Logic is what we use in order to justify the decisions we have already made. In the third place, we have motivation, which defines why this decision at this point. And in the fourth place, we have the reward, which is the benefit that we get from this decision-making from this product or service. So let's first start with the emotion. We tend to think that emotions are infinite, and that's why sometimes we avoid thinking in them. But let me tell you that these emotions are finite. There's a defined number of these emotions, and they may be some economic factors, knowledge factors, social things. So there are several emotions that define the decision making process, and therefore it's important to model. Um, the consumers and seeing what consumers need, what type of emotions. It's not the same making a decision based on an economic factor than making a decision due to um, a social belonging or a, a health issue. So there are a lot of decisions and emotions, but they are defined. And all of those decisions are prevalent in everything we do, from an article or message that we read, Everything creates continuous impulses of emotions, such as fear, curiosity, social belonging, and everything. So everything has an impact in us. Secondly, logic. So as I mentioned earlier, logic is what we use in order to justify the decisions that we have already made. And that's what important things such as the product description come in, what statistics or factors do we have, and this many people use this product or this um, prestigious company uses our product or having some referrals or even some recommendations. And in the last place, 
the price. And if we go into the price, the emotional side of it becomes a little bit more complex. It's also important to understand that throughout the evolution of a product, this this logical side or a value proposition may change. So when Slack was launched, since nobody knew what Slack was, what it offered, the value was based on products. We have a messenger, we can connect employees, you can send files. So it's more tangible. Whereas when you get a TV, they tell you everything the TV can do. But as time goes by, we know what this does and we know other types of tools, which are the ones we use in order to influence consumers in the decision-making process. In this case, Slack has bet much more on a strategy saying that almost 160,000 consumers use Slack nowadays and this many number of companies use Slack. So based on the momentum of the product, you can also change the strategy. It may also be that you do marketing campaigns and that you start promoting different uh, things from your product. So for a consumer that already knows the product, you can have some re reliability strategies or you may say that you need this because the competition already has this. Whereas in other times where the consumer doesn't know this product, you need to have more vocalized conversations or communications in order to convey what your product is. So then we go into the motivation. So motivation is what, what makes you make a decision. And then two variables come into play. The variability and the decision you make. So a professor from Stanford created this model. On one hand, we have the motivation, and on the other one, we have the ability. So in this case, he's talking about vaccination. You need a lot of motivation and a lot of skill so that everybody wants to get vaccinated or the other way around. If there's little motivation or if there's little ability, nobody will get vaccinated. And then in between, we have this emotions of fear, or hope for all of us to overcome this pandemic. So what is ability? Ability is the point of entrance. Let's say if I want to buy a product, my, my, my point is that I need to know what the product is. For instance, if I want to get a shampoo, then I have an opening barrier that is lower. For instance, what are the benefits that I get? And then I can make a quicker decision. So based on what we define here as an ability or the entrance barrier, and also the time the decision-making process is shorter. And finally, there are this, this things that motivate us or influence us in our decision-making process, which is the trust it gives you, the urgency, the scarcity, the, the feel of belonging and liking acknowledgement. Let, let me try to give you an example of a marketplace, but it could be any type of marketplace for most of the products we use, which use this motivational boost. So here, in the case of Amazon, we could see the description of the product. And the first thing you pay attention to are the stars, four stars. This number of people have given reviews. So this is a motivation. On the other hand, it tells you you have 24 products in stock. So if you want it, you need to buy it because it will be gone soon. Or they can offer you a promotion and tell you you have one minute to get this promotion. So what happens if you don't get that promotion? You have a feeling of scarcity. If I don't get it now, I will lose it. So all of these are mind games that companies use and it's important to use them in a smart way, but always thinking first on consumers, always thinking about the emotion and about what defines the decision that has led you there. Now we go into the reward. What is the reward? Well, the reward is the benefit or what consumers get once they have purchased or when they have experienced this product or service. And we can define three types of rewards. The first one would be an extrinsic reward, such as I've saved this much money. 
I've saved up this much time, or it may be intrinsic, which is the benefit that I've gotten from complicating this action. For instance, I don't know if you've used some apps that um, that monitor uh, how much or or, or the, the distance you have been running. You have been running 10 kilometers in the last three days. So you have a super runner badge. So this is some sort of a reward. In the third place, we have a more social reward, which is more of what your family and friends and colleagues think of you. For instance, let's say that you took a digital course and you get a badge of an IT professional. So this gives you credibility in terms of you being very knowledgeable about IT processes. So on the other hand, we have something that is more complex, which is that this benefits are reduced throughout time. That means that the benefit that you get from the first time that you've done something, for instance, I've gone running and I ran 10 kilometers. So this gave me a really high benefit and I get a notification on my phone telling me, congratulations, you're a super runner. But when I've been getting this super runner batches for 20 days, the effect it has on me is way lower. But when we define this rewards, we need to acknowledge that as time goes by, they lose their efficacy. And therefore, we need to create this habit in the first times. So let's say that you first get motivated. So you say, I ran 10 kilometers. So let's say that we are proposing this other product that helps you optimize your eating habits. So it's a little bit about trying to get these habits in consumers. So now we go into the point of what's the point of uh, having this uh, for consumers. So on the one hand, we understand consumers and also the process that leads consumers to the decision making so that we can modify the value proposition from the standpoint of the companies or even marketing campaigns such as this. I need to define the type of products I want to launch or how I want to improve my products. So the first thing I'm going to think is what my consumer wants. What do my consumer want? So they want to use a product faster with fewer clicks in order to get all the way to the end when um, purchasing in any marketplace. I want to make a really simple purchase. So this is really easy from the consumer standpoint to get the product that I want and to have it in my cart and that I can get it home and that I can get it home in 24 hours and for this to be the product that I have requested and that I can show it to my friends. So this would be the process and the standpoint of a company is how can you optimize your products or even your campaigns based on this consumer? So the key is by testing because bottom line, we don't have the answer. And regardless of the analysis that you do, things change and it's also really difficult from your office to define what your consumer really wants. So you need to understand your consumer in order to create those insights that define your strategies. And therefore, you need to test and, and, and see if what you have predicted that would happen really happens in reality. So in the same way, when we make improvements to our product, we need to understand who are our stakeholders or where is our product influencing? In some cases, it may be in consumers, but it can also be in some governmental organizations or investors or other companies. So it's an entire context. So we need to see how this product improvements, how do they influence or change our environment? That means that I will make this product improvement because I think it will offer me a competitive advantage. So this means that my competitors do not offer this and how long will it take them for them to offer this? Because sometimes competitive advantages, as we know, are not undefined and then consumers evolve with the evolution of our products. So you continuously need to be creating ideas. It's not a process that you just do once and say, I have the strategy done for the rest of the day, but it's just that you've done this improvement and you need to think about what's coming up next, how to improve it later, or how can I offer the best product for my consumer? How can I... How can I get the consumer loyalty? How can I still keep them with my product or service? So that's when we need to keep thinking continuously about the consumer and the consumer process and 
knowing what defines those, those triggers that d drive that decision making. And finally, how can we improve the experience for them? And finally, let's, let's talk about testing. Why is it so difficult to do a test? Well, let me start by telling you that the same thing that we've been mentioning, that emotions define decision making in consumers. Also by business managers or as marketers, we also have these emotions that influence our decision making process, regardless of how objective we think we are. There, there's always an emotion or something that influences our decision making process or our tests. So why is it so important to test? Well, this is in order to eliminate as much as possible this bias, these things that influence our decisions. So how can we make a good test? So in order to, to make a good test, you need to define two groups that are the same. How do I do that? Well, first of all, you need to think of everything that makes them not the same, which is if I choose this population and this other population, how different are they? It could be from how much money they have, what is the average age in that population. And when I'm going to do that test, is there something that may influence that moment? Or is it better to do it in that same population at two different times? So it depends on you choosing what a good test is. And in many cases, it, it's based on iteration and running different tests in order to see what's a good test because bottom line there's a context that it's really difficult to completely eradicate and sometimes it's also given by us that means that you want to do a campaign and you want to do an a b test and it turns out there's a problem with a product and the application or the change has been launched the next day or has come out the next day on the b test so you have one day of delay, which means that afterwards there will be a national test that may influence the result of that B test. So it's very important to understand the environment and the context and define what's a good test. And then, as I mentioned, we have a valley. So if we see that there's a curve explaining exactly what we thought that we needed to explain. Then we say, OK, so this is a good test and we have validated the hypothesis. So let's move on. So this is the danger that a lot of managers follow. So it's important to have a very structured methodology in terms of what a good test is. So I recommend to think of cohorts, thinking of different segments of your population or your target audience and different ways to test them. And once you have defined what's easiest for, for you to see when having um, a, a test when you have a neutral environment test then you say this will be my a b environment and then test b a to see what are the results and then this is just a matter of testing one on one and continuously i mean testing is not something that you just do once a year this is something that needs to be or a way that we need you have intrinsically in any manager or any marketing person there's no right person everything has to be tested and fortunately every time things are easier to get tested now let's go into the q a session if you have any questions please let's open up this space to do this Well, thank you so much for all of those questions. I'm going to start with the first one. In my experience, how can we reduce bias? Well, I don't really think that this will be a very clear answer, but what I mean is that bias will always be there. As I mentioned earlier, we also are ruled by this emotions, and these emotions are the ones that determine our decision-making process. So what's most important is understanding this biases exist in our previous experiences, influence our decision-making processes, and we need to be as methodical as possible. So this is where we have the reforge model. It doesn't go so much into the quantitative side, but each of those steps can be translated into an Excel a spreadsheet or a chart where you can define which are the emotions that influence on your user. You may probably use each of these steps so that 
once you do the A-B test, you can have some results that are not as biased. There will always be bias, but something else is using some equipment. I mean, because it's not um, a unilateral um, decision making, but, but if you have multidisciplinary teams with different experiences, there may also be bias. So those would be my recommendations, being methodical and using cross-functional teams to avoid this. Uh, in terms of the second question, what are the tools that I recommend to know the user? I would say that any type of um, market research um, tool from quantitative to qualitative, my suggestion would be for you to do it methodically and continuously. It's not like you're doing a quantitative for a certain problem where you validate and execute. It should be part of the culture of the company and being continuously testing and improving, meaning for us to do the A-B testing ideally on a weekly basis, otherwise on a monthly basis and trying to improve the knowledge that we have of our users. And there's another question, which is how long do you use to take all of this reforge process? Well, it's a continuous process, so there's nothing really finite. I would say that each of these steps must be around approximately a week minimum. You start with market analysis, a quantitative or qualitative, I mean, a market research and an insight generated, and then you create your hypotheses, you validate them. And this entire process must be iterated. So at least I would say a week per step. Obviously understanding that you have this information and then you have to create new researchers uh, that may take from two to three months. So that also influences on the total time of this process. So um, I don't know if there are any further questions or anything else that you want to know. Otherwise, um, it was a pleasure to be with all of you. And if there's anything you need, you can find me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to help you out. It was a pleasure having you, Marta Fuste. Thank you so much for everything that you shared with us, as well as answering the questions from our audience.